important because yeah, it brought some money into yeah. the uh, into the our art, as we say. So, well, then let's let's talk about um, the the what was happening in the Vancouver scene, and uh, you know, you're talking maybe prior to the war or just the, what the amateur situation was. in the late thirties, just going in, just go what it was like because it was very active, very well, and alive. Uh, the Vancouver Little Theatre had their own house out on Commercial Drive, their own theatre, and uh, did a regular season. And their, the shows were very high standing, but amateur. No one was paid. Uh, the Players Club out on the campus was uh, out at UBC, was UBC involved just for the students. So, although they're active. Uh, then the strolling players. Great. We did uh, in the strolling players shows. These are all commercial successes from New York. There was nothing experimental in our theater in those days. We did the tried and true, and we performed in the uh, Victory Hall. Um, probably nobody would remember. It was on Homer Street, in the five uh, four 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 five hundred block, Homer Street. But they had a stage and they had a hall and they. Musical Society also used that uh, accommodation for their annual. Uh, that's where we did ours. Another group called the Maskers. They, uh, they were very active. You found each other out pretty well when the drama festival happened. And the drama festival was great because it was sort of a catalyst. It, it, held, it held the theater together and everyone competed and it gave it, um, it, gave it a, um, a, ch a challenge. We won it, as I uh, mentioned earlier to you, in 36, I think it was, with a re condensed version of Barrett's of Wimpole Street. And uh, went to, to Otto with it, which was a great experience. We had to take our own food on the train, which was donated by packing houses, tin sausages, and the like. Uh, you could cook on the train in those days. They had a car that you could, with a stove, and you could do your own cooking. Made it very economical. However, when we got to Montreal, uh, rather Ottawa, we were billeted, and then there was no possible worry there financially. Um, yeah, the, the, the what year was that? That was 1936, I think, John. We won. I had, we had competed in another year. Interesting enough, although we lost the year before Famous Players, it was with the Valiant, and uh, it was a, sh a short one. They were doing one acts. That's why the Barrett's of Wimble Street had to be condensed for their, to fit their requirements of 40 minutes. But the Valiant was picked up. It got very good press, and that was something else. The, the uh, Dominion Drama Festival brought the press, and your group got a lot of coverage in the press. Uh, we had, um, uh, I don't know what my point was about the, the, uh, the festival and the he, he, yeah, about the festival and its importance. It was the, um, Oh, whatever. It it was a uh, it was a very good thing for theater to, to have the uh, Dominion Drama Festival. Moving on from the Dominion Drama Festival, uh, its help, the CBC came to town in the late '30s, and it was a very very big help because they there was a fee attached to what you did. And uh, that makes a big difference. It made a big difference. I, uh, I was involved, after I got out of the service, uh, with the theater under the, with, um, you mentioned the theater under the stars. Uh, you mentioned CBC Radio. You were also involved was, in that in, after you came back from the war, too. I yes, they, they were doing drama, and they, uh, it, Andrew Allen had arrived on the scene and was very important. He knew what he was doing. He was excellent as a 
director. Could you describe Rama. him as a director and perhaps maybe the rehearsal? He was very, he was a disciplinarian. You, you would tear, of course, we didn't tape in those days. We're alive. And, and the horror of making a mistake on a national show, for instance, when you did a drama, was um, something to be avoided. He did not use people who could not talk <laughs> without, you know, at the risk of running and making mistakes. Uh, so we were trained and disciplined in those days not to make mistakes. You just had to zero and concentrate and not goof. But uh, he, he himself as a director was very knowledgeable. He knew exactly what he wanted and he insisted on getting it. Wasn't a, it wasn't a freewheeling deal. He knew exactly what he wanted. He understood his material very well. And so f there were other very good producers. There's Doug Nixon, Peter McDonald. Was Essa part of this? Essa, Essa came in later years. Essa Young came. He, I think he retired in Victoria someplace. And, or went to the Victoria University. But he... Um, he was not there in the early in the early days. He was in Toronto. He worked Toronto. Um, Peter McDonald. I mentioned Peter McDonald. I mentioned Ray Whitehouse. Uh, there were about five or six. They, they changed very quickly and usually left to go to Toronto. That's where they all seemed to head for. And including the talent, a lot of our talent, our closest friends followed. Uh, Andrew to Toronto, but my wife, we were married in 42, she, uh, she had been cast as one of the four regulars in the CBC's farm broadcast called The Carson Family. It was a 15-minute sugar-coated uh, drama for the uh, farm news, and it was had a very, very heavy listening audience. I don't think it could necessarily get anything else up in the interior than the CBC. And the, um, the four regulars, which was uh, Catherine, my wife Catherine, Bill Buckingham, Irene McKenzie, and Alan Pierce, they were the son, daughter, mother, and father set up. Uh, that changed, the format changed over the, and they were on with that farm broadcast for 25 years. It went Monday through Friday. In the later years it was taped, but it was live, uh, most of it. Um, I was uh, involved with it for 17 years as a regular when uh, the, uh, I think it was Juan Root who was a regular on it left to go to Hollywood, and um, CBC asked me if I would take the role over. And I fortunately did. Was Dorothy Davis involved in that? Picture? Dorothy replaced the Irene McKenzie. Dorothy became Mrs. Carson after Irene McKenzie left. With to, she moved. She moved up in the interior. Uh, and then Dorothy took over there as Mrs. Carson. My wife and Bill Buckingham stayed with the show from beginning to end. Um, it, it, it was a, a real sinecure to have something steady like that. Plus the fact that there were many other uh, you know, opportunities for acting with their dramas. And I think the first, the pay it seems ridiculously low now in terms of what you get now. But then there's very little production on CBC now. Um, I think it was ten dollars a show or something like that that we got. Oh, I know what I was going to mention about the the amateur theater. Uh, being amateur, I made my first money off of it because the Strand Theater, the it's which the players group, one of the players groups, is torn down now. Uh, was on Georgia Street. Uh, they bought our Valiant. Although we lost in a drama festival, we came second, but we didn't win. They took the Valiant and put it in conjunction with a Ruth Chatterton movie. You probably wouldn't know Ruth Chatterton either, but uh, it was a show movie. And 
they gave a lump sum of everything we did in the amateur theater, we put to our next productions, of course, into our rentals. But they, we were each given a dollar. <laughs> we did it for a week. The same thing happened when we did win the following year with the Barrett's of Wimble Street, that condensation I mentioned earlier. They, um, they took it into the Orpheum Theater and we did it along with a movie and presented our our condensed version. It was always good. It was a climbing, a stepping thing, a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to get into almost the professional mode of, of acting. Because up until that time, um, people were, you went to the States, you went to England if you wanted to make a career of the theater. You, you, it wasn't possible at all in Vancouver, not at all. What were the audiences like at that time? Were there a the audiences were very good because uh, they did have road shows coming through from England and the States, but they had their own followings and I think they were probably a little more... No, I can't say that. There's more competition now in, uh, in the legit theater, but no, the audiences were very good. Very good. Um, then with the with the theater under the stars, the CBC, the the forties after the war finished, just sort of sprouted. We got the Totem Theater started, and then there was the Vanguard Theater. We performed in the auditorium on Georgia Street. The, Van, uh, the Totem had their own established their own premises on the uh, in the Electrical Workmen's Building, and. Um, Yvonne Firkins, who had worked with the military uh, entertainment in, uh, in the lower military camps around Vancouver with a show, we did personal appearance. My wife and I both in that, and, they, and we took it around to the different, that was up until I had to go into the service myself. Um, to, and so Yvonne then took other musical groups on. So she, she started to get initiated into a, a uh, producing, uh, uh, to produce, to, and so she started the Arts Club Theatre, which is still going, still going very strong. But it was upstairs on Seymour Street in the old fire hall. But Yvonne was the, uh, the one that started that, it's sort of an outcome from her military camp entertainment thing. There were a lot of women that were very key in, uh, in theater all across Canada because, especially during the war years, I guess, and that sort of carried over and, 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 and obviously in, in, Bank, in British Columbia, Dorothy Somerset is, is looked at as one of Dorothy, the women. Dorothy Somerset, much loved, uh, but almost totally confined to campus. Do you think, uh, what do you think her contribution was though? Uh, I think it was her continuing interest in theater, which probably speeded up them getting a theater faculty out of, on campus, and the building of the Frederick Wood Theater, which was a big step because Dorothy had been producing shows with the students in, apart from the Players Club, in the Quonset Hut, uh, which I happened to be, in, Bill Buckingham and I were invited to be the, we did an Earl Burney reading on Earl Burney's uh, poetry uh, to open the Little Quonset Hut. Small beginnings, but it was left over from the war. And Dorothy took advantage of it and, and started to use it with a little audience. And then that, of course, grew into the Freddie Wood Theater, Frederick Wood Theater. And, uh, Bill and I, Bill Buckingham and I were invited to be the first, the initial production of Salad Days was the first produ uh, produced show in the Freddie Wood. I worked later in it as the, the uh, they started then, you see, not only students, they, they brought in equity people because equity started in Vancouver first with ac ACRA, not ACTRA, but ACRA for radio. There's no television until 54. Um, then it became ACTRA with the television. Uh, they, um, 
the equity uh, was about 50, 1950, when they signed agreements with Tuts to, uh, to work with equity contracts. Then the Freddie Woods Theatre had guest artist contracts. The Metro Theatre out in Marpole started to do shows with, and bringing in, bringing in the, the more experienced professional people to work with the amateurs. Uh, heightened the shows, and it was a very, very good deal all around. And equity was not expensive to work with. They were not terribly demanding in their fees for their people. And it kept the actors oiled up, working too. And you also had, uh, there was also the Everyman Theatre, Sydney Risk. Sydney Risk Everyman Theatre, that uh, was also Sydney, I always saw, associated with UBC. He, he was also out very much in, in the suburban, in the rural, where he traveled around the province, even into Alberta, adjudicating the amateur efforts. And uh, then he started, now the Everyman's Theater, uh, which performed. I didn't have any contact with that, but I certainly did when he started to produce at the Avon Theater on Hastings Street, which was an old burlesque movie house, and uh, 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 I'm trying to think. It was a blank verse play that we did. It was the, the first play, Dorothy Davis and myself, and Jesse Richardson were the cast. Wid not, not the Widow of Ephesus. That the Widow of Ephesus is based on. Yeah, can't think of it. Uh, but that, that started the Avon going, and uh, Dorothy, was, Dorothy Davis was certainly associated with that. She, she did Tobacco Road and some other shows, I, I can't tip off my tongue right now, but I produced for them, directed for them, um, Of Mice and Men with Lon Chaney Jr. They, they brought in stars from Hollywood. What are your memories of that production? Is the name stand up Of Mice and Men for you? Yes. Of Mice and Men. Um, mm, it, uh, Bruno was, Bruno Gerussi was, was in it, Wally Marsh was in it. We had an excellent show, but my, he was, he's a very, very difficult man to work with. And uh, you just wanted to leave the theater and run in the fresh air. Well, after an experience with him, and he begged me to go with him. He wanted me to go with him and do his... Uh, his productions in different cities in the States of Mice and Men because he had a passion for it. He won an Academy Award for his performance in it, so he had backup publicity on it. He was very good as Lenny, but terrible to work with. He was too emotional. Too emotional. You mentioned Bruno. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm asking people about their memories of Bruno now, especially uh -huh. more than I would have uh, because he passed away. Um, well, in that, well, he had a, probably a small role in that what, particular production, or what do you remember of him in that production? Any Was that the first time you'd worked with him? No, I'd done radio work with uh, Bruno worked to CBC radio shows, so we worked together in many a cast. And also in Theatre Under the Stars, he was in only one show to my recollection. I directed, uh, that I directed, or anybody else directed, Carousel. He was he played Jeter, Jeter, Jigger, Jigger, the villain in Carousel. Yeah, uh, he was not a musical performer, but many of the people who worked it weren't necessarily musical performers. You know, they, if you could patter a song, it worked. Uh, when you think of Bruno, what do you think of? Well, I think of someone who, who did very well for himself. He promoted himself very well. And he went east where the Stratford was and identified with that. And then he had his own CBC show. No, he was aggressive and talented. And what more can you say? You get the, you have, sometimes it's just when you get the breaks. I'm sure that happened with Bruno too, but uh, he always came through. He was, according to Thor, the only person that could have played Stanley uh, in Vancouver at the time in the streetcar named It's Desire. possible. Yeah. It's possible in the streetcar named Desire. Yes, he did that at Totem. Um, 
Did I tell you that Dorothy and uh, Dorothy David, and myself, and Evie Young were the first show in Totem? We did uh, biography by Bur S. N. Berman's biography, and that that started the uh, that started the, the Totem off. Do you remember that production? Do you remember the challenges? I guess that. Uh... Well, the only challenge I think came w with the the concept, which was uh, not proscenium presentation. And it didn't take long to get used to. You got the audience sitting on three sides of you. And instead of being totally in the round, this production of Bowers, they sat on three sides. That was the first one. And they later changed it so that they sat around and did a theater in the round. Uh, no, we were delighted. I, I directed for Totem also, starts No Exit, uh, later, uh, later on. My finger and everything. Was uh, I, there was a story? I don't know if it was during your production of the uh, the time when it, the rain was raining and um, Thor decided to instead of losing the performance to invite people to drive their cars up and and sit within their cars. It was almost like a drive-in theater. Was that? Uh, well, that he, you, it, the uh, theater for the total they produced in the railway. The before, in their first year in Ambleside Park, when they oh, they're out in Ambleside Park. Yeah, I don't remember that. I have no recall of him I think ever. It was the very first, it was a summer, and then after that, after they faced the, the climate, they decided they looked they needed something. You know, with, with yes, the weather wasn't going to be an issue. And that's when they went. They went over to uh, to the they had indoors. Quite an interesting air conditioning system in that building. I don't know if you know the story behind. No. Them bringing ice cubes up to the big fans, and in fact, uh, one of them fell through the ceiling at one point. Oh, good. It wasn't during us and Berman's <laughs> effort. <laughs> None of us had any injury. What was your impression of Thor Arngren? He was obviously a very young man. And well, it, he, you had to admire his punk. He, was, he seemed to be very young. And although I wasn't old at the time, I, I, I seemed to feel I'd had years of experience, I guess I had, compared to Thor. Uh, and I just thought, how could he make a go of it? You know, financially make a go of it. But he had stick to itiveness, and it worked. And he got some good people cast well, and uh, it lasted. I don't know what stopped it. Maybe they tore the building down or something. Yeah, I think they they were allowed anywhere to, because of fire reasons or something. Mm. They went to Victoria and they came back. I guess they never were able to find a, a venue that really worked, and uh, then you went to Toronto, and that sort of petered out soon after that. Yes. Carried on. But I guess they were, would you say they were the main competition for Tuts? Uh, no. They weren't? No, no. We were a summer theater, and we did an outdoor production. We did a totally different product to what they were doing in Totem. Totem was doing legit shows. They weren't doing big musicals. We had large casts. We always had 16 card-carrying members in the pit. And we had 24, an average of 24 ensemble, plus your featured roles, and invariably very talented lead imports that we brought in from New York or, or uh, Hollywood. Two of the uh, individuals responsible for the establishment of, of Theater of the Stars were Basil Horsfall and Evie Young. Evie Young. Yes, they were, they were two that worked with the initial production of um, the Midsummer Night's Dream, outdoors, with two casts, audio one and visual one, down on the field. I did not see that. I, I didn't see that production, although it was, I think, in the 40s, and I certainly wasn't fighting for our very lives then. Uh, I must have been out of town doing something. I did not see it. However, uh, they were then uh, inspired from that, uh, or uh, interested in starting in the park. But the real power behind the Theatre Under the Stars, its, its, its entire organization and continuing to the end of the 40s was Gordon Hilker. He, was, he just made the thing. He made it hum. What did he bring to it? Why did well, he, he, brought, he brought a, um, a dictatorship. That's what he brought. He, he didn't, it was a civic theater. 
And so often you get committees working. Garden had no, no part of it. He, he said there's no room for democracy in the theater. He was a dictator. And he would go and he, if on scenic night, when we, when we saw the scenery for the first time, if for some reason I saw him just scrap a whole set when he said it's not gone, no. He would do the same thing with costumes. He, he, he had a very critical eye and would adjudicate. We had always had our scenic and costume and lighting rehearsals after the last performance on a Saturday night. Then the next show would take over. They would strike the old set. We didn't fly anything. They were all on cars, you see, the, because of the shell. That would all go, with the last show, then the, the, the uh, dress parade would take place with Gordon out front always. And then we would see the scenery, we would see the, the um, costumes, and we would have a dress, which would take us usually to about 4.30 or 5 in the morning. And it was a great experience, we all loved it. I mean, most of the people were young, and the thought of working all night was a, a dramatic event in their lives. There was no problem, no problem having the people less than happy about that arrangement. And uh, they were allowed to bring a friend, a couple of friends, who also loved it, with their blankets and all. A little chilly at three and four in the morning. Um, but Gordon, Gordon was, Evie Young and ba Basil Horsfall, dear, dear people, I worked with Evie a lot. I also, uh, he was senior stage director. He, Bill Buckingham and John Bethian were the three stage directors that handled many of the first shows throughout the early 40s. I started with, uh, Gordon gave me, invited me to be, after I got out of the service in 1946, he invited me to do two productions. It was uh, Mary Widow and the Count of Luxembourg. And I, I was surprised, but pleased. I wanted to be in the Theatre Under the Stars very much so, but I never thought I had much of a future since I was not a trained singer. Uh, however, he had seen me in a 1938 production that the Kiwanians had staged. Every year, They would the Kiwanians would put a big, show on, it, usually Gilbert and Sullivan. This time it was Naughty Marietta. And Edwin Lester from the La C LA Civic Light Opera came in with the stage director and his imparted cast, Irene Manning and Sterling Holloway, the comic, and uh, a Sue Brett and uh, a tenor, Paul Douglas. Uh, and I was cast as in, in one of the principal roles of uh, Etienne. And Gordon saw me and, and remembered. And so without an audition or anything else, he says, Jimmy, I'd like, I'd like you to accept a couple of roles in, and give it some thought in, in the summer season of 46. He named the shows and I said, sure, all right. I th I'm not sure what the salaries were. It was, I think, $75 for the week, which in those days not bad. <laughs> Not bad. And um, then the following year, I did a couple of shows. Now, uh, the, uh, the next year, he says, I'm going to do something, Jimmy. I'm going to ask you for the next season to work. We're going to be doing seven shows. We had been doing, I think, five up to that point. We're going to do seven shows, and I want to give you a season's contract to work as cast the three directors, Bill Buckingham, E.V. Young, and uh, John Bethune, if they, they, I didn't think they even had their, their books, the librettas that hadn't arrived. If they want to cast you, you'll, ca you'll be cast. If they don't, you won't work, but you're going to be paid. I'm going to pay for the, seven, for the whole term on a, I, I think it's the first con and only contract, first time he did that and the only time he ever did it. I worked five of the seven shows that year, and I don't know how I did it. You know, you know I had a week's rehearsal, mm -hmm. and uh, often you could work 
while the show was being done in the bowl, we, I, I would take the leads uh, who came in from outside, such as, uh, well, whoever they were. In the next show, I would take them and rehearse the university, because I did 12 years out on, uh, on campus with the Musical Society. I did their annual productions. When, uh, are we rolling? Yes, sir. Um, when you're doing that many plays in a season, obviously there's a lot going on. I guess you're probably, you're performing and then you're rehearsing the same, the same time, basically. Yes. Was that, was that any more challenging? No, it, it, they were segmented so that the music would be learned by the, by the uh, ensemble and the, the leads would be, get special rehearsal time. Uh, with a pianist, uh, then the dancers would be rehearsed separately, and by Thursday, the the line the, the book was ne they're never heavy in a musical as far as the actors are concerned and the singers who had to talk. However, we always and we never failed. We put that show together in the rehearsal room on Fridays. It had to be ready. And in between, they're getting costume fittings, they're getting measured for costumes, and all the like, such as that sort of thing goes on. It was busy. But I think most actors and performers love that involvement. They like the busyness of it. And there was no one ever objected, in my experience with it, to the program that we had for rehearsals. Did, um, how did you enter the, the realm of directing for Theatre of the Stars, how did that come about? That came about by uh, Gordon, John Bethune, whom I mentioned as being one of the three, left for Toronto. Now he's, he's missing a director now. So he says, uh, Jim, uh, next summer, um, John's going, uh, I want you to do something for I want you to direct a show. And and I want to come and see it, and I want it to be good. And I said, I'll do my best. So uh, the little theater uh, allowed me to do For Love or Money, I think, was, I think that was the name of the show. And it, uh, it was a success, got great reviews. I had a very good cast. He said, because if I like it, I would like you to take John's position as a director. And he liked it, and of course, then I started in 40, 49 to direct. I did Roberta and Song of Norway. Now the big shows are starting to come in. That was the first with like Bloomer Girl, Song of Norway. I mean, the, the uh, Merry Widows and that, those sort of light operas that had been the stock really for it. We're not, they started to roll off of the Hammerstein and Rogers, just starting with the big shows and we're starting to get them. So I was really flattered when I got Song of Norway because it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful book show. Um, and Roberta. Now I, I was, Betty Phillips was cast and he said, I don't know how you're ever going to cast that role because the girl has no sex. It's a sexless role. I've never seen it pre performed yet with any, any interest other than the, uh, the voice for singing. But Ka Carl Norman and, and Betty were the two strong singers in her, and he allowed me to have Betty. She had worked the ensemble a couple of years before that. Um, then, uh, we rehearsed with, with Roberta five, three, three days. We had one week's rehearsal, which was five days. We rehearsed it for three days. Gordon came into the rehearsal, watched the rehearsal. He says, I don't like the leading man. And I said, why? I would mention his, I don't think I would, I should mention his name now because he became very well known. He became very well known and still is very well known. Um, particularly in Canada, uh, he said he doesn't got it, he doesn't he he's not right for I just don't well this is what I mean about Gordon he didn't like the scenery other way he didn't like the performance and I said well we've got two days he said I said who's how can we fill it if, you know, he said you'll do it 
I said, oh, all right. As, di as director, I was familiar more or less with the lines at any rate, you know. But it was, it was the leading, young leading guy. He was supposed to be a big football player and I was anything else but, which, um, I mm, wish I could remember his name. He still does shows out of CBC. He was writing in the press, uh, reviewing in the press, and he said, to, he gave me a very good review. He said, I didn't look like a football player, which he's supposed to be. But who cares, he said. He, said he had other, other qualities to compensate. And uh, so I did the part, and, and then along came Song of Norway, which Basil did the music for, and he was excellent. It was gorgeous Greek music. And that was his, his forte. He wasn't, he wasn't really as acquainted with the, the later musicals, with that type of music, but he didn't live to hear it, to be challenged at any rate. But he did Song of Norway, and I th that was a, a memorable experience, uh, to have him working with the, uh, with the singers at the Greek music. Was it, was it Difficult for you to make the transition? Was it something you wanted to do, or did you still pine to be up on stage performing? I mean, when you were this? Uh, no, no. I I still did it. I did Finian's Rainbow. Uh, Evie Young directed it, and Evie Young performed in it too, and it was a great success. Uh, that was in '52. I still was able to keep my hand in it, and uh, I, as I say, I did about. Mm, Ten, 10 shows all together. But I could see that the future was directing. The future was directing. And when Theatre Under the Stars finished in 1963, for uh, many reasons, I mean the weather particularly, uh, we have rain out here, then the Vancouver International Festival was starting their seasons in our beautiful, new, gorgeous Queen Elizabeth Theatre. And night football was coming in, and it seemed to be a lot of people interested in football at night under lights. That all those things came together, plus rising costs. Though we did cut down, we were only doing three shows at the end because of expense. And uh, it ended in 1960, summer 1963, and in the fall, um, I was uh, asked by the Cave Supper Club to do a production of Pajama Game, a full production of Pajama Game, not a tab version, a full production of Pajama Game. And uh, I did it, and it it drew the crowds in that was very gratifying. It was a dinner, dinner theater. The Cave was a well-known night's club in Vancouver, has since been torn down. However, I did that and it was, then he, that was followed by uh, Damn Yankees with Joey Brown, which was not my choice, but Ken was a great, but Ken Stoffer was the, the owner of the club, and he was a great baseball fan. I think his son worked in some capacity with one of the leagues, and he, so did Joey Brown. Joey Brown was a great uh, baseball fan too. He was a movie star. And he came up to do The Devil, and uh, it was not good. It was not good. He was not, he was not good to work with. He, he just, would sometimes go into an, he was getting old, he'd go into another play that he knew about, and he'd start giving lines for that, and he always carried with him um, the boy who did the, the lead, very good for the role, um, knew all, everything that Joey Brown did. He did, he worked all the shows with him, and so he would just be in the cast and would be right there to give a prompt immediately to get uh, Joe E. Brown back on the course again with the lines. And that helped, that helped. But unfortunately, uh, he did not draw the people in and uh, Ken couldn't pursue with that, pro that policy any longer. That ended, and, 
Uh, I, Theater Than the Stars finished, had finished, another door opened because Dan Enright from New York, who had with Screen Gems, had seen the production of Pajama Game and he said, he was so impressed, he said, who did this, blah, 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 found out and he offered me the job of directing his, uh, talent directing and casting his two uh, television national half-hour shows, they're two, two half-hours a day uh, for national. And he was, a, he was a real guy to work for, I can tell you, he was a real stickler. We loved it when he, when he left again for New York. However, <laughs> he, he uh, booked me to do that. Well, you can imagine, I, it was just a wonderful thing now with Touch finished. And you see the television was starting to take over. Now this is CTV. Now we've got BC, uh, CBC working television, working radio, and now we've got CTV. So the, the city is starting to get fields where actors could make a living without having to necessarily sell shoes on the side. They could work, and the commercials went along with it, uh, you're getting commercials. So we started to get a stable of really excellent people around. And it has now evolved into the filmmaking here with the pool of talent. It was a, an encouragement and I think it's been a magnet even to a greater extent since they've started to do the movies here in Vancouver films. What was the name, what were the names of the two shows? Yes, People in Conflict and Magistrate's Court. Those were the two. It took 43 people a w during our production we did 39 weeks, and 43 people a week, 25 in Magistrates Court and 18 in um, People in Conflict. They had to be interviewed. They could not be actors, incidentally. Uh, if they were, they had, they, were go they had to be real people. Dad did not want a professional casting. So you had to see a lot of people, and you had to put them through, as I say, started to get sort of dermatology bills. I was with it for six years, very busy, very busy for six years. And then uh, after the show, he wanted me to go to Australia with the show. And I said, no, our daughter was just started university out here and we were living rather close to the campus and I thought it was such a convenient setup. And who wanted to go? Uh, I'd love to have gone now. I wish I had a, <laughs> just seen Australia. Uh, but he wanted me to go down there and do the show down in, Aus in, in, the show, uh, in, the, in Australia. Uh, I turned, no, I turned that down. And um, however, I stayed with CTV and did Three for the Girls, Banjo Parlor. What's the Good Word, which was another show out of New York, they hired me to do a game show. Um, a really great guy from New York this time. And um, the, the work just piled up and piled up. And everybody was making, particularly actors, they, they got a nice big fat working fee for every one of our 43 people, permits to work because it, it was unionized. And uh, it was just great for action, which was one good bright light and another good bright light right. about it. I wanted to go back a little bit yeah. to, uh, in back to the theater and the stars. Uh -huh. and, uh, in terms of your directing, uh, I, I sent over a quote I don't, um, by Jean Howarth. I guess she was a critic at the time. Yes, Jean Howarth. Well, or I, I was interested to have you mention that name because I had forgotten about her. Uh, I think she wrote in the press. Did you? Would you say that she captured you, the essence of your directing, or would you, if you had to describe, she says, just moves us quietly and pleasantly about as if he thought, actors are reasonable human beings. He is more interesting to watch than a show could possibly be. Did she say that about me? Yeah. Oh, bless her heart. How could I have forgotten her name? But uh, I don't know. I mean, to try and analyze yourself. Oh, there was one thing I'd have to almost quarrel with Jean about this. 
that very little was done quietly and smoothly. The time, the clock, the clock. So you, if, if the actors weren't, if the performer was not getting what you needed, you got up there and you did it for him or her and get on with it because we haven't the time to, to do the method bit. So if I work quietly under those circumstances, I'm interested in that myself. But I can't say I did it all the time quietly and smoothly. You also, I guess the audition process was quite large. I mean, you would look at many actors in the evening, I guess it was very quick. Yes, it was a, a civic society that I mentioned earlier. And as a civic society, there wasn't anyone you could not rehearse, uh, not to audition if they wanted to be in it. And so we, in the spring, um, Bill Buckingham, myself, Harry Price, um, Evie Young, while he was with us, uh, would meet, I think, about two times a week, depending on how many applications we had. And with a pianist, there were some of them brought their own, and we would audition. Now, this was for the ensemble or any particular role that we might spot as saying, hey, she would be good, he would be good, I think she'd be right, I'll, I'll make a note of it and I'd try them out for a separate audition. Uh, but they would, we would, we would have at least 20 people on a, on a night because they, uh, they flooded in, even people without any talent at all, they wanted to get up there and sing. And when we did The King and I, I think the whole of Chinatown came down <laughs> no, because they're gorgeous youngst kids, youngsters, just wonderful, but in great quantities. And we had no trouble casting the, uh, the King and I for the children. So that was the pre-rehearsal uh, bit, was the auditioning in the spring, two or three months before the shows actually got into it the final stages of uh, being ready for rehearsal. And we, uh, we invited anyone to come down. That's what City Hall wanted. Harry Price. Yes. Tell me about Harry Price. Harry Price had been, a, when I was a kid, I used to skate around uh, on roller skates because I lived in the center of the city. And Harry was doing a cabaret called the Ambassador Cabaret, and you could hear the music, and I, I could see his picture, and Harry Price and his orchestra. And I was to stand outside and listen to the, the dance music, and uh, it was great then to be able to work with him. He was a very patient man. I did many things with him. He did auto shows. I did auto shows. I MC General Mike's auto shows. And those industrials that uh, were uh, also a part of the uh, theatrical activity in the 40s and 50s and 60s. I, I uh, MC'd many of them. And Harold uh, quite often would be having the music. So we worked together in that respect too. And got along champion with him just very, very well. I. Uh, yeah, good. <laughs> well, Harold liked to, uh, uh, not Harold, but uh, Harry. Um, he liked, we had to watch him because of the, uh, huh, huh, huh. and uh, he only once uh, carried too much of it into the pit and started to talk to the little kids on the stage during the performance. God. So I had rescued him in the afternoon from a cocktail bar at the behest of his dear wife. We got him down there. And that was the only time. Other than that, he was just as disciplined as could be in the rehearsals and the shows. It may have been. He was human. He also maybe because he's the only one who wasn't sheltered by the rain and felt he needed to keep himself warm or something. Well, it, it sometimes works. But I, 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 I even then can't remember him complaining about it. And he certainly was the only one that was not covered. <laughs> the, 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 if it looked like rain, 
the show had to go on. We couldn't make a cancellation because of that. But the eyes would be there. They'd get the butcher paper. The ushers would go down, and just in case, just in case, and then usually that was the case, they would have these big folders of butcher paper um, to put over their heads or over their clothes or whatever they had. And they would do it. And it was interesting for the audience, too. It was another dimension of exposing themselves to theater. The, uh, in fact, I guess the, the first time that, I mean, I said in my notes, the first time that it rained, the audience, this would be before the butcher paper was even in existence. It would be. They requested the performance to continue, I guess, because... Uh, it may have rained, uh, like, right after the second, first act. And uh, they may have canceled the intermission because of that and said, carry on with the second act. Do you want to carry an intermission or carry on with the second act? They get it from applause, blah, 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 blah. And then... Uh, the, your your notes you seem to say that the audience the stay the cast applauded the audience, a natural thing to do. They either did that bec instinctively because the audience was very nice, or somebody had been to Russia and found out the uh, performers applauded the audience under all occasions. They did, but I can't remember this being one of my shows. Although it probably was, I didn't get to see them all at at later time of the week. Another thing that was said, that the, the, the effect that Tuts had on certain people and the loyalty that uh, it, it brought out in certain uh, audience members who yes. uh, would almost go to uh, every production if they could make it. And there was a woman, I mean, you probably, I don't know if you even knew it until I wrote my notes, Audrey Miller, who came from oh, Winnipeg. I just, I knew her very well. She was a dear girl who worked, I think, at that time in the St. Paul's Hospital. And she came to every performance. She bought a season ticket for every night. This is how she spent her vacation money. And she sat in the front row, and she was a, a, a sort of a, a, a well-rounded little girl. And uh, we would include her backstage, we invite her backstage if somebody's birthday and we had a cake and a bottle of champagne or something like that, we'd always invite her back because she became an almost integral part of the cast. And you know how she did? I had a quiet talk with her one night. And she said, I said, what brings you here every night like this? She says, I play a different role every night. She fantasized herself in each one of the leads. Tonight I'm going to be Ralph Mackelson, who was singing the lead male role. It, gender meant nothing to her. She'd play them all. And uh, her whole fantasy was, uh, uh, with the theater was her identity with the, what she was looking at. And I don't know. That's interesting. A little bit so, but uh, it, it, she would take over the, uh, she'd play every, 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 any role she took a fancy to her. That was her that night. Tomorrow night I'll do something else. Tomorrow night I'll do this or the whatever. She was a wonderfully, wonderfully faithful girl. Was you say she was, she's now in... Well, no, I guess there was another woman that came from Winnipeg, I guess. Oh. Uh, I guess maybe it wasn't Audrey, but there was someone else that I guess that uh, had heard so much about Tess that she saved all her money up to come out and see. Uh, but I don't know how regular that was, but it was just another, I guess, example of the effect that the theater had on certain people. And, had reached obviously beyond the borders of the, the city. And yes, I would have sworn that she was with us to the end, but maybe not. Uh, the, the 63 when we blew the whistle. And she always in the front row, as close to the stage as she could get. But never wanting to be on stage. Well, I think she realized her, the impossibility of that. She didn't have to. She was up there. With, she was playing every role. Get as much kick out of it as if she were. <laughs> up there. Yeah, probably more. The, uh, there's also stories, I guess, about the, the way members were treated. I mean, the, the lighter side, I guess, of a, a gentleman who went to see Brigadoon with his wife, and I guess she tore her stocking and wrote a letter to thank them about the production. I guess he enjoyed it a lot mm. and happened to mention that uh, his wife had damaged stockings, and they went to the extent of even sending her, sending them $2.71 or something to... They reimbursed? They reimbursed. 
oh, I'm sorry, he must have said it facetiously, and I say, and they would carry on with a gag. I never heard anything about that. I never, I know one night I went and I had a new, brand new white jacket. I should have sent them a bill for this. I sat on the wet boards when I got up, the, <laughs> the back of my white jacket had the wet cedar lines on it. I, I was very unhappy about that. But, oh, I'm sure there are a lot of people who had things. What, what, the most hazardous thing with the audience was the, the lack of toilets. They just did not accommodate the city hall with that. And, and there was always a feeling that, why don't you have a roof? Why don't you get a roof? Gordon, Gordon tried to motivate that, Gordon Hilker, for some time. City halls, in many, many did not want us there. They didn't like the problem of parking, taking up all that space with the cars. They didn't like the, the business of having to uh, build the bowl itself to make it a more convenient more convenient architecture for the presentation of shows, until one, it burned, it got on fire, and they had to spend some money on it, so I think we got a couple of toilets out of it for backstage. Everything has its silver lining. Uh, but no, they wouldn't budge with toilets for the audience. They had to go leave the, leave the enclosure and go to the pavilion where the t toilets were in, and very inadequate. They weren't built to accommodate crowds like that. We never did get a roof. Are we, uh, are we doing tape? 26 minutes. Okay. Well, we will change. Because yeah, I wanted to ask you, but doing the research, it was interesting to read the clippings. And every year there was this rumors or commitment or excitement about finally they were going to 